Okay, um, let's do this. So, uh, hey folks, um, hope everyone's doing well. Uh, so I guess today, um, I mean, we're probably just going to jump right into it, but um, I guess want to, you know, make sure that everything's going ship shape with the the projects. Okay, the mini, I guess is, I'm going to call it a mini project because it is mini compared to the previous one too. Um, and with regards to the uh, the cho your choice of, you know, what, what are you going to work on? What technology are you going to look at? Um, you know, I mean, uh, there's a there's always a question of how specific you want to be. Okay. And I haven't told you, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to, to really specify that unambiguously. Okay. So, um, you know, so for instance, you could do literally, you know, the concept of a computer and everything that arose from that. Okay. Um, or electronic computer, I guess. Um, that's pretty broad. I mean, it's not impossible to do, but it's pretty broad. You might probably go a little bit more specific than that. Um, you could do the concept of the internet. That's still at this point in the in, t in time somewhat broad, uh, but but you could do that too. So so those are those would be relatively uh, big technological groups, right? Um, but then you can go more detailed, right? So you could do you know like I mentioned like streaming something like that. Um, you could do like a you could do a specific company basically. You could do like Twitch if you want to go even more specific, okay? Um, and things like that. So so uh, I wouldn't go beyond like a specific company or product, okay? But um, you know, you do have a little bit of latitude in how, how narrowly you want to focus in on this. Okay. Um, and, and sort of the more specific you get, I mean, you'll be able to, to kind of talk in more detail about that. Okay. And you can, you know, if, if you, if you did Twitch, you could give like a history of the company and things like that and exactly how things played out for them and so on. Um, but if you go more broadly, then you have a chance, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be talking about stuff that's going to have bigger impacts in a societal sense, because they're going to sort of be more broad based. Okay. Um, and so maybe that's more interesting for you. Okay. So it, it, it's, it's a little bit of a micro macro kind of trade off. Okay. How, how, what level of aggregation do you want to look at things? Um, it, it's up to you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's totally up to you. It's, it depends on what you think is most interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So if, you, but if you have questions about how to, how to navigate that, definitely let me know. Okay. Um, okay. And then, uh, yeah, so I think that's it for the project, um, just sort of in kind of discussion. Um, so I, for this point we can, we can go back and, and keep talking about the Romer model. Okay. So, um, I wanted to, so, so just to, you know, refresh your memory, you know, on Tuesday, basically we, 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 we started going through the Roma model, okay, which is, which is a, which is sort of a classic model of, of what's called endogenous growth, okay, um, where we're thinking about what does it look like when, when, you know, you create new products, okay, how's that all play out, okay, and, and what kind of incentives does that create um, for researchers that are, or inventors or whatever, that are trying to create these new products, okay, and then what are sort of the, the, the aggregate level outcomes for society, okay, um, and, and I, I mean, the use of this is really, you know, uh, like the solo model, right? It'll, it'll give us, um, well, the solo model kind of laid a foundation for how, how do we think about modern economic growth? Okay. So it, it, it a lot, it gave us just a framework in which to talk about things. Um, but it also, you know, it gave, it made specific predictions, you know, about the, the, how, you know, the, the share of income going to labor and capital are going to be roughly constant over time. Um, and, and, you know, how we're going to converge to, to certain levels of, of output. Um, but it also let us do this growth accounting stuff, you know, where we attribute growth to different sources. Okay. Um, based, you know, by using the data, we, we create these, we, we can attribute growth to these different sources like uh, technology and capital and labor. Um, so the, the idea for, for Romer is to, well, we want, we want to do that. Okay. Um, and so it'll give us a kind of a, a language with which to speak about this. Um, but. It's not clear that it'll give us an accounting framework necessarily, okay, but it will also allow us to think about different policies. Um, so, so with Solo, the other thing you get is is you you can talk about what's what's the effect of a policy, you know, uh, what you know, if you uh, change, you know, or, or what's the effect of changing the savings rate and things like that, okay. Um, in in Bromer, okay, you can actually do better in some sense. You can look at say what's the effect of a tax, you know, what's the effect of a research subsidy. 
uh, what would we expect the effect to be really. Um, so you can talk about policy, you can talk about patent policy, right? If you add in some bells and whistles, you could, you could talk about patent policy uh, in the sense of making predictions about you know, what should those look like or what would happen if we, if we implemented those. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's the idea, but, but the, the basic story on the Romer model is, you know, is, you know, you have people inventing stuff, you know, sort of like a, the garage, you know, like the Apple inventing, inventing things in your garage or whatever. Um, you make up, you make a new product. Okay. Um, and then you want to sell that product. Okay. And so there's sort of like an Amazon out there. And you say, well, I want to list this on Amazon. Okay. And, you know, you sort of, you announce a price, people buy it or don't, depending on sort of like whether it seems like a good product um, and what the price is, um, whether they can afford it and how much they want to buy. Um, and that, and so then that's, you know, as this, this producer of this, this gizmo, you know, you've announced the price, you get some revenue and some profit. Okay. And that's, that's sort of your deal. Okay, and you just keep once you start up your business, you kind of just stick around forever. Okay, there's no, there's no sense in which another someone else comes along and makes a better version of your gizmo and sells it or makes one that's cheaper. Okay, uh, because it's just like people keep coming up with different types of gizmos, right? So it might be that uh, people come up with another gizmo that's sort of substitutable with yours. Like it does, it does kind of the same thing, but differently. Okay. Um, right. So you, you are kind of facing something like competition, but there's no sense in which you sort of get kicked out. You just kind of slowly bleed away customers to these other products. Okay. Which is fine. Okay. Um, yeah. But, but at the same time, uh, because of economic growth, right. Um, people have more income too. So they like people have more income. So they're buying more and more different types of products partially because they have more income and they can, they can afford to. Okay. So, so you, you never really go away if you're this gizmo producer. Um, okay. And to, but the idea is, okay, you, you, you kind of stick around forever, um, making some profits and, and so then the, the, there, there exactly is where you can think about the incentives to do research. Okay. Because you can say, well, I can, you know, the, the benefits of doing research are, I may come up with a new type of product. If I do, I get, I can sell it and make some of these monopoly profits forever, basically. But, but of course I discount the future. Um, so, so it's not like an infinite amount of profit. It's just some, you know, net present value, uh, associated with that. Um, so that's sort of the benefit. The cost is of course that I have to pay someone to do the research or I have to do it myself. Okay. In which case there's an opportunity cost of I well, I could have gone around and, and just gotten a, re a regular job. Right. So, um, there's a cost that which is going to be kind of proportional to the wage, the prevailing wage. Okay. Um, and those, well, that's, that's, that's the choice, right? That you have your benefits and your costs and, and you make a choice based on that. Okay. Um, and that, that we can model that decision. Okay. Uh, we can, we can think, you know, put ourselves in, in the, the shoes of people making that decision. We can model it. Um, and that's going to generate like an outcome. Okay. I mean, it'll generate sort of an equilibrium of this, this model. Okay. And then, and then we can think about is that, well, what does it look like? Is it reasonable and things like that? Okay. So we've already done some of the work. Okay. So, so last time we worked through, okay, we, we set up, okay, there's a, there's the Amazon company. It kind of aggregates everything together. There's these little intermediate producers making the, these different goods, which we're, which we're going to call, we just index them by this letter I. Okay. So I, is just like your good number zero, your good number 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, right. And there's a certain, there's a, total number of goods. Okay. But it's not like an integer. It's like a, a real number. Okay. So, uh, there's a bunch of goods out there, suffice to say. All right. And you're just, we're just thinking about at any given time. We're just thinking about like one of these goods producers. Okay. Um, all right. And then the, and basically at the end of the last class. Okay. Um, we, we thought about, you know, we, 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 we essentially came up with the demand function, uh, for these producers. Okay. So, so, cause you know, you're, you're this producer and you announce a price, you guys, here's, here's what you can buy this for. And some people are going to buy it. The question is how many people are going to buy it? That's a demand function, right? Um, and the, the demand function essentially, you know, it came from, um, this, the choice made by this, this Amazon type firm. Okay. So let me jump over to the, the, uh, iPad here. Um, 
right? So up top, you see we have the final goods producer, quote Amazon, um, right? And they they have this production function, okay? They can uh, produce some amount of output, right? So they're combining labor here. They're combining labor and, uh, you know, all these different uh, intermediate good XI. So they, they integrate that all together, right? So you got multiply labor by, by this whole integral of, of a bunch of all these these goods, you know, sort of agglomerated together, okay? Um, okay, and so what they're gonna do is they're gonna, they're basically, you know, you know if, if they buy more good XI, right? Then they're gonna, that's gonna increase production, okay? But but there's a cost, right? So they're gonna, but they're gonna maximize their profit. And what the, but basically what they're gonna do is they're gonna buy, buy a good XI until that marginal benefit or the marginal product really uh, is equal to the price. Okay, so that their input price, so the, which is which is their cost really. So they're gonna equilibrate marginal product and cost, which is a kind of a standard thing that firms do, right? So um, that's what's going on here, right? So you write down their profit, capital pi, um, and you take a derivative, here and set it to zero, right? Okay, and that gives you um, this this function here. You know, uh, this is an inverse demand function done here. It's a mapping from x to quantity x to price p. Uh, this is really your demand function mapping from that price you announce p to how much you're going to be able to sell, right? Um, okay, and so. Um, yeah, and, and I guess you know here I should talk about you know what what determines this this demand function, right? Because this demand function has this you know there's an elasticity notion here, right? So I I don't know how you guys have done it in past courses. I mean, sure, surely you talked about the elasticity of demand. Okay, oftentimes it's just sort of graphical, um, but here I mean the the notion of elasticity really is a concrete mathematical notion, right? So essentially, you know, how does PI affect XI? So Increasing PI, this is in the denominator, so it's going to decrease like the higher price. It's going to lead to a lower amount of sales, which makes sense. Okay, um, how kind of quickly that happens is mediated by this one over one minus alpha, right? So, and in, and in fact, mathematically, we call that an elasticity. So, this one over one minus alpha term is is exactly mathematically the elasticity of demand. Okay. Um, Right, and so why is why is it one over one minus alpha? Why is that the elasticity of demand? Okay, uh, well, um, and and like why why is it why is that the result? And why do we call that elasticity? Well, you know, if um, if this number is really large, okay, then if you increase p by a little bit, demand just tanks, right? So so this number being large really is high elasticity. Okay, if this number was like zero, for instance, uh, then changing p doesn't change x at all right which which is low elasticity so, so it really is you know the, the classical notion of the elasticity of demand okay and then <clears throat> that's sort of the semantic question okay and then there's the there's just sort of the mathematical question why is it that it comes out to be to look like one over one minus alpha exactly well um it has to do with the the role of alpha here one of which is the substitutability across these goods Okay, so essentially, um, it, it's useful here to think about different cases. So imagine that alpha equals zero. Okay, um, if alpha equals zero, well, actually, if alpha equals zero, I mean, these goods basically don't matter. Okay, if alpha equals zero, this just x i to the zero, which is just one. All right, so you just get an a here. So if alpha equals zero. Well, they, they actually don't really need, even need to, to buy these goods. So that's a bit of a silly situation, but but it's actually more instructive if you think about alpha equals one. Okay, if alpha equals one, check out this here uh, production function. It's just, you're integrating over all these XIs linearly. Okay, and and because you're integrating over them, just, just XI not raised to any power. Okay, you could, they're highly substitutable. Right, you could buy a little bit more of one and a little bit less of the other, right? And let's say they had the same price, um, you would be just as well off, right? So you you can ship between these things. There's no there's no decreasing um, marginal product for for each good XI. So so you can just substitute between them arbitrarily, okay? And what does that mean if you can substitute between them arbitrarily? 
Well, that means if, if I'm an individual producer and I increase my price, people are just going to go and buy something else, which is just a perfect substitute for that, right? I have, I'm, I'm, I'm exposed to a huge amount of competition from the other XI producers. Because remember, there's not just one XI, there's a, you know, a billion of different XIs out there. Okay, so if, if I, if all our goods are sort of just kind of highly substitutable, if I raise my price a little bit above everyone else, the consumers are going to jump ship or the, you know, this, this purchaser, Amazon, is going to jump ship and buy something else that's a little cheaper. Okay. And that's highly elastic demand. Okay. And if you look here, when alpha is one, then this thing is, it demand is almost infinitely elastic, right? So this is essentially like it converges to infinity. Okay. So that's like infinitely elastic. Okay. So that's the limit. Okay. But as you get close to that limit, the same thing is true, just not as extreme. Okay. So, um, so yeah, that's the idea that, that alpha controls how substitutable these are, these goods are across the different eyes. And that means it also controls the elasticity of demand. Okay. Um, okay. And so the kind of the end game here is we want to, we want to eventually find the profits of these firms. Okay. And if you think about it, how, how, so we've got a map from 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 this notion of substitutability, which is alpha, into elasticity of demand. Okay. Now, how does the elasticity map into like the profitability? Well, um, if the goods are highly substitutable, you have very little latitude in changing your price because people are just going to jump ship. You're probably not going to make that much in terms of profits. You really have you have very little market power. You're not going to be able to make, charge that much, and so you're not going to make many profits. Okay, so um, as as alpha goes closer to one, okay, highly elastic demand, highly substitutable goods, you're not going to make much profit. You're going to price at marginal cost. Okay, as alpha is smaller though, okay, the goods are they le they're less substitutable. Your demand is less elastic. You have more ability to, cha to charge a higher price, which is what you want to really do as a as a monopolist, right? Um, and you're going to make more profit. Okay, so there's a clear path from sort of alpha substitution, elasticity, profit. Okay, and that's conceptually, and we can, we're just going to walk that path mathematically. Okay, and so we write it down a little bit. We, we have demand, we have the elasticity of demand, and all that. We just need to figure out, okay, well, what prop, what price are they going to set or like announce that that will maximize profit? And that's what. We're going to figure out that price. Okay. Um, okay. So then, yeah. So we're going to do that. One brief side note, though, about this final good producer. Remember, so this this is the there's um. So remember, I, I think I drew it before, but you know, there, there's the there's sort of the the sort of the Amazon producer, right? And then all these different, you know, I one, I two, I three uh firms these intermediate i firms are selling to amazon and that's what's going on here okay um they're selling you know well they're, they're really saying they're selling xi1 xi2 xi3 and so on they're selling their their good xi uh but then there's also labor which is like that's out there okay they, the, the way it works here is kind of like the intermediate firms just they're just like highly automated kind of stuff okay and then the, the labor is most is is on the outside it's used to um uh, ship the goods to work at the store or whatever, uh, you know, so it's, it's more for distribution and logistics. Okay. Um, but it, you know, you, you need labor, right? So you need people to do stuff. Um, Amazon, this Amazon firm is also hiring labor. Okay. Uh, and so they, they're also going to, um, basically, uh, given a wage, they're going to demand a certain amount of labor. Okay. Um, but fortunately it's this, this market, is competitive okay so they're not gonna be a monopolist about it okay they're gonna they're gonna face some competition from other similar types of stores um and and so but you'll get some you'll get some relationship between the wage and the amount of labor demanded okay and that's going to be important okay but we don't need to think about it right now so we're not going to think about it right now but keep that in the back of your mind okay but let's just keep walking down this road of of thinking about these these intermediates right so these this is the the ant what I'm gonna call, be calling the Amazon and then these down here <clears throat> these XI firms are the intermediates. Okay, I didn't do a good job of drawing it. They're the intermediates. Okay, um, 
Okay, so let's let's think about them. So we have the demand function. We just need to write down profit. And it'll be all set. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Now lasso this thing, which is what other word for copying it. And uh, go to the next page. Okay, so let me just paste this here. Boom. All right, so we, we're going to need that because that's the demand function. All right. So we're going to, but we're, what we want to do is think about profit. In this world, profit is the end all and the be all of the intermediate firms. That's their that's their end goal. Okay. And what does profit look like? Okay, it's it's going to be relatively simple. All right. Uh, it's going to be price times quantity, their revenues basically, minus uh, their cost, which is going to be R. I'll talk about it in a second. Times how much they produce XI. Right. So um, R is their cost because basically they're they're as I talked about last time, they're renting capital, okay, to operate their business, okay? They rent, if they rent one unit of capital, they can produce one unit of the good, basically. So that's an assumption, is that, you know, one unit of capital leads to one unit uh, of um, the good, and one unit of capital costs R. So R is like the rental rate on capital, okay? So you spend R, you get a unit of capital, and you produce, well, you produce one unit of XI. Okay, so then the total cost is R, R times XI. Okay. Um, all right, you can also, if you want to combine these, you know, you can write it as your, your price margin times your quantity. So this is like price minus marginal cost. That's your profit margin times how much you actually produce. That's your total profit. Okay, so this is just mathematically true. Okay. Um, all right, so, but, but, okay, so then, we, you know, we need to think about, what's what's their what's their optimal choice okay because they're um they're gonna choose a price that's gonna lead to a quantity vis-a-vis -vis this demand function here okay xi and that's gonna lead to a certain amount of profit right because if you choose price that tells you xi and if you look at this this equation here if you, you know you chose price you know now xi let's say you know r then you can figure out what profit is okay so let's let's do that okay so it's really just plugging in. So we're saying, okay, you know, PI times XI, which, which is now L alpha over PI, whatever. Actually, um, we could, mm, it's actually easier, I think. Sorry to, to, to switch up, switch this up in here. It's actually easier to, to think about choosing XI, right? Because remember, you can choose PI and figure out quantity from the demand function and then figure out profit. Or you could equivalently, you could choose the quantity. Say, I want to produce this much. The inverse the inverse of this function, the inverse demand function, will tell you how much you'll be able to sell that for on the market. Um, and then you can figure out everything else from that. Okay, so let me, remember last time, we also derived, you know, just the that inverse function here, uh, PI as a function of XI. I'm going to copy that. Okay. Then I'm going to jump over here and I'm going to paste it. All right. So now we got that inverse demand function. Okay. So we could also think about you choose XI. The inverse demand function tells you PI and then you can plug that into your profit and then you're also going to be all set. Okay. It's actually a little easier just algebraically to choose it to do so you're choosing XI and that's why I made that, that sort of last minute switch, but uh, they are equivalent in the end. Okay, so pi i, yeah, so, so now we're gonna say, okay, pi given a choice for x is gonna be alpha L over xi, the one minus alpha, okay, times, so that's pi times xi, and then minus r times xi. Right, so now we have, Given a choice for x, i, we know exactly what pi is, right? Assuming we know it, we know the rental right, the rental price on capital is r. That's we're taking that as given, okay? And we know l is we're just taking l is the total amount of labor out there. It's, we're taking that as given, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, and this actually you know kind of simplifies. Okay, so you're gonna get alpha. You'll get l to the one minus alpha. Okay, and then you'll get. Well, you got x i to the one here, 
times xi to the alpha minus one, basically. So, so really, it's just xi to the alpha. Okay, and you can see that looks like a cobb legless production function, which is not really a coincidence. Okay, so you're going to get something like this. Okay, so that's your pi. So that's the thing we want to maximize. Okay, and and you know, and you're, it's usually instructive to draw some you know graphs okay what is this going to look like okay so so really what this tells us is given a choice for xi what's pi i right so xi is our x variable literally and pi i is our y variable okay and you can see if, well if you produce zero you're obviously not going to make any money because you haven't done anything all right um the first the revenue term right that first unit you produce you always make a ton of money on that because people need your good. Someone out there needs your good and they're willing to spend a lot of money on it, okay? As you produce more, people stop caring as much, but it, that first unit always gets you a lot of revenue, okay? So, so the slope initially is gonna be very high, okay? Of the revenue curve and then the revenue curve is gonna level off. In terms of cost, it's the, the, the marginal cost is just constant, okay? So you're, you're gonna start off really good and then things are gonna kind of turn around. At some point, you're gonna, you're going to produce so much that you've depressed the price price down to your marginal cost level. Any any point beyond that, you're going to start going down, and eventually you'll um, produce so much that uh, you'll, you'll make negative profits, and and you clearly would not want to go beyond that point. Okay, but in fact, okay, and this is kind of a wonky looking function here, but it's a function. Um, in fact, you know you're you're going to want to choose exactly the the maximum here, which is called like xi star. Okay, just like, you know, so there's going to be some maximum point there, right, where you just make the most profits you can. And you can see at that point that the derivative of this function is going to be zero. Okay, so it's just standard argument, that, you know, you want to maximize something, it's going to be zero, but we can also see kind of where do you start, where do you end up, and so on. Okay, so that's the graphical. Let's do the mathematical, I mean, the algebraic, which is actually taking the derivative. Okay, it's at zero. Okay, so zero should equal the derivative, which is what we're going to calculate right now. So what do you get when you do that? Well, you're going to get alpha, you're going to pull down a power of alpha from that xi to the alpha, which is going to make this an alpha squared. You get alpha one minus alpha, and then you get xi to the alpha minus one. Okay, and then minus r, just r, because that's the derivative of r xi. Okay, so that's your derivative. Okay, um, right, and so what that means? Well, that means that R should be equal to, you know, alpha squared, alpha the one minus alpha xi to the alpha minus one. Okay, which, well, you can combine some stuff. So this is going to be alpha squared times L over xi. Oops, it should be the other way around. No, it should xi to the, to the one minus alpha. Okay. You can write it like that if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, but but um, so so what does this mean? Well, really, th what this is saying is that your marginal cost, so your your marginal revenue, which is this, should be equal to your marginal cost, which we know is R. Right. Okay. So you're balancing off revenue and cost. So you know where the derivative is zero, those two things should equal out. Right. That's that's why you get this standard marginal but marginal product equals marginal cost result from a, a firm. Okay. Um, all right, so then, so so now we'll, you know, so what does this mean? Well, what, what this means is, well, okay, what we really want to do is, is figure out what xi is, right? So we want to solve this equation for xi, all right? So we can we can do that. We're smart. Um, we just have to kind of divide, invert some powers, okay? So so basically, you know, we can, uh, you can kind of cross multiply move that to the other side, you're going to get this. Okay. So I'm going to rearrange some stuff. You can kill off that power. So you get xi over L is equal to alpha squared over R to the one over one minus alpha. Okay. Then finally, you can move that L over to get proper xi is L alpha squared over R one over one minus alpha. 
Okay. So, um, so that, you know, th this, this is really kind of the final answer in some sense is how much are you going to produce? It's this firm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, I, I, not the final answer. It, it's one of the answers that we were looking for. I guess, it, or, you know, the, the final answer might be the profit, you know, how much you're actually going to make. All right. Not how much you're going to produce, but how much you're actually going to make in terms of profit. Okay. But that's, that's your XI, right? And that's exactly, that's like, you know, that's what I'm calling up here at XI star. We took the derivative, set it to zero, figured out where it, where it's maxed, and that's our, our XI star point. Okay. Um, okay, so then from, from here, then it's kind of, well, we want to we wanna figure out that profit level. Okay. Um, but, you know, let's, Let's take it slow. Let's not let's let's not go too quickly, right? So we, we want to figure out profit, but maybe we want to figure out price. Maybe we're interested in what price you're going to charge. Okay, so remember PI. Um, if you go back up here, we have our inverse demand function, right? So remember, given XI, we have this inverse demand function here that tells us what PI is. That's how we're able to solve this whole problem. So we can plug that XI back into this inverse demand function and figure out, well, what's the price given that we, we produced and sold that much, how much were, did we have to charge or how much were we able to charge really uh, to sell that much? Okay. So it's just a matter of plugging that XI we have in down there into this inverse demand function. Okay. And you can see actually, well, okay. So um, the demand function is basically just to write it out here. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, alpha, L to the one minus alpha xi to the alpha minus one. Okay, that's coming from the inverse demand function. What we want to do is plug this xi in there. Okay, so then it's alpha L to the one minus alpha. This is an x times this whole thing. Okay, this is going to look really messy at first, but it simplifies. This whole thing raised to the alpha minus one. Okay, and so. That looks like a doozy, but a lot of stuff cancels. You'll see. So we're going to get alpha, L to the one minus alpha. Then we're going to get L. When we distribute that alpha minus one inside, we're going to get L to the alpha minus one, which is going to kill off the thing just to its left. Okay. So those are going to cancel. And then we're going to get times, well, that, you know, something raised to the alpha minus one over one minus alpha power is just raised to the, the minus one. So this is just going to be R over alpha squared. Okay. And so, you know, these L's cancel. One of these alphas is going to cancel. And so at the end of the day, you're actually just left with R over alpha. PI is R over alpha. That your price, <clears throat> right? Your price is going to be your marginal cost divided by alpha. Okay. So it should always be that whatever price kind of the, the at the optimum, whatever price you charge, I mean, it should be greater than your marginal cost. Because if it's not, you're not making any money, right? So you want to make money. You at least, you at least don't want to lose money, right? So, um, and since alpha is less than one, alpha is in a, just some number between zero and one, it's going to be greater. R over alpha is going to be greater than R. Okay, so your price is going to be greater than your marginal cost, right? Greater than R, right? Okay, that's good. Um, and also you can see the role of alpha which is kind of what I was talking about before with this, this uh, substitutability and elasticity. You know, if alpha is one, things are perfectly substitutable, demand is highly elastic, and lo and behold, you'll see when alpha is one, your price is exactly equal to your marginal cost R, right? So you make no profits, okay? You make no profits. Um, you, uh, yeah, and, and actually, yeah, so the, the model kind of breaks down at that point. But but as you approach that, you make less and less profits, okay? Um, and then at, as alpha uh, uh, gets smaller, you know, that means these goods are not very substitutable. As alpha goes to zero, your price actually goes to infinity, basically, okay? Um, and the idea is, okay, uh, if you have highly goods that are, sorry, that are not substitutable at all or nearly at all, 
okay? Uh, you know, each of those goods is, is highly necessary, right? You need to buy that specific good because there are no substitutes for it. So they're all necessary goods. Um, you have a monopolist selling a necessary good, that's a potent combination. It's kind of a bad combination oftentimes, okay? So um, this is where you get sort of the Martin Shkreli style. You know, you're selling some rare pharmaceutical that people need to live. You're the only producer because you have the uh, the patent on it. So you, you you jack up the price a lot, okay? And uh, yeah, so so they you know they, they, that that's why you see the really high price, okay? Um, and uh, let's see, and in that case, you would see if you look at the quantity produced, this alpha, if that goes to zero, this thing goes to zero. You produce a very small amount and you charge a really high price. That that's what a monopolist would do, okay? Now, I'm not saying that's an ethical thing to do. And in fact, people got really pissed at Mark Shkreli when he did that. So, and also he went to jail for other reasons. But, um, you know, uh, uh, that's that's the outcome if you have a sort of an unbridled monopoly like that. Okay. So, um, yeah. All right. So then, uh, <clears throat> so, that, so that's, sort of the, that's the outcome that in terms of price and quantity, P and XI. The final thing we want, we, we really want is profit. Because once we have profit, then we can take a step back and think, okay, do people want to do the research to get into this position where they have, they're the producer of this new product, okay? So we need, we need you know, to figure out whether people want to do research, we need to figure out what are the, the gains from doing that? What are the benefits? And those, those come in the form of, you get to sell this new type of product and make a certain amount of profits, okay? So, um, well, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're getting there. All right. So we, we know PI, we know XI, um, <clears throat> now we want to figure out, and remember, I mean, I'll just write it out again. This is what we had for pi, your, your price times quantity minus marginal cost R times quantity. All right. Which you can also write as if you factor it out price minus marginal cost times quantity. All right. And actually that second form is, is a little easier because because we, we know it. Price is, is also proportional to R. Okay, so let's use the second form. Let's use that. So those are gonna PI is gonna be R, not P. PI is gonna be R over alpha, okay, and then minus R, right? And then XI we know is L alpha squared over R. One over one minus alpha. Okay. All right. So that's um, not the not the pretty not the prettiest thing in the world, but it'll, it'll do. Uh, you know, we can we can simplify it a little bit. Okay. So in particular, we can because the price is proportional to the marginal cost, we can factor out that R. Okay. Um. So then, what do we left with? Well, we'll have you know, one over alpha minus one times L times, uh, well, okay. I guess, yeah, we factored out the R. So we're gonna get R, L, alpha squared over R, and then one over one minus alpha. Okay, all right, so we, we can simplify it a little bit. Still not, still not the greatest, um, but we can do one more thing, okay, it, which is, uh, factor out basically a one over alpha. So we can also factor this into one minus alpha R over alpha. Let's put the L out front here. Okay. Um, we're almost there. Okay. This is turning into a bit of a bit of a bear of a derivation here, but you can simplify it a little bit more, just kind of by combining stuff. Okay. And at the end of the day, you'll get this. You'll get L alpha one minus alpha, and then alpha squared over R times alpha over one minus alpha. Okay. So you can get that. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay. Now, well, what does that accomplish? Well, uh, it's, it's pretty complicated at this point, but we're gonna be able to simplify it a little bit more in a second, okay? Um, 
But at this point, okay, we can see a couple things, all right? But you, you can see, first of all, right, as uh, if you have a low marginal cost, okay, you're going to be able to make a lot of profits. Okay, so if R is low, your profits are going to be high and vice versa, okay? Depends on alpha, it's a little, I mean, it's it's, it's very complicated. It's not, not straightforward, okay? Um, but in terms of the, the marginal cost, you'll see that, okay? Um, all right, so let, but let's let's take a step back and think about what all of this implies, okay? Um, so the the thing that kind of is really okay, you can see that. The, the the thing that's that's important here, okay, is well, we, you know, first of all we figured out what the outcome is, okay. Um, the other thing is that you know we eventually see that you that every firm I is going to produce the same amount, okay. You know, because we kind of we set up this this economy, okay, um, sort of symmetrically, right? So if you think about the production function, all the XIs looked the way they went into the production function was exactly the same, okay? There was no weight; uh, they were different for XI. There was no, the alpha was the same for every I. All that the the so so there's total symmetry at the outset, right? Which is which is um, well, I mean, it's an assumption. It's, I mean, obviously, some goods are more important than others, but we sort of, from the model's perspective, we're just saying they're all sort of equally important, okay? And so you might expect that the outcome is also going to be symmetric, and in fact, that's what we find. We find that you produce, you know, xi is something over here, some function of, you know, these parameters, but it, there's no i in here. There's nothing that differentiates one i from the other. So, so they all produce the same amount. Here, you can see they all charge the same price, right, because they all have the same marginal cost, Okay. So the, the outcome is symmetric, all right? And, uh, you know, what that means is, okay, and let's, I'm gonna jump to a new page, okay? What that means, well, that's gonna make our lives a little bit simpler, okay? Because remember, what's happening is, you know, you have this capital, okay? And you're sort of splitting it up to produce, you know, X1, X2, X3, and so on, all these different XIs, Okay, and then you're sort of recombining those with labor, you know, so the labor is out here on the side to produce output. Okay, so we, we introduce this sort of intermediate goods, these intermediate steps, okay, uh, to produce output. Okay, but um, remember at some point last time I said, well, that, you know, at the end of the day, you, you, things need to add up, right? So that, that all that capital that you split up, it's got to go somewhere. Okay, so that capital, you know, if you integrate up all the the usages of XI, that should add up to K, to the total amount of capital. Okay, which at, which at any given time, it's just, you know, there's a certain amount of capital in the economy. Okay. Um, all right, so then, uh, yeah, so so that, I mean, so that's, you know, that's what we do expect, uh, you know, that, that, that change, things should add up. And, you know, we found that all those XIs were the same, okay? That each individual XI had the same value, okay? And so that, you know, that what that means is when you, you know, when you integrate over these XIs, each individual I has the same value, and let's just say that that's equal to X, you know, without the I, that, that integral should just be the total number of them times that value X, right? So there's A goods, you're integrating from zero to A, there's A total goods, right? So here, the, the number of goods is A, okay? Um, and if each one uh, uses amount, some amount X of capital, then the total amount of capital U should be A times X, right? So K is equal to A times X, all right? And so that means if you just invert that, that X should be equal to K over A, right? So you're taking capital and splitting it evenly amongst these A goods. That means each individual good should use K over A, right? So it's just basic accounting, all right? Okay, and so, so, but, you know, so first we had to show that you use the same amount for each good, but once we show that, then you can use basic accounting to show that X is just K over A, okay? Um, all right, and so, you know, you can actually get a good amount of sort of mileage out of that fact, okay? Out of the fact that the Xs are common, that are, they're constant across I, and in particular equal to K over A. Because if you go back to, 
the production function. Remember the production function looked like this. Got some labor. We integrate all these XIs with that alpha power. Right? That was our production function. Okay. We plug in this X value now. So you go from zero to A, plug in that uh, K over A. K over A to the alpha di. Yeah. Okay, so we're integrating again a constant over all these A products. So each A product, you know, they're using K over A. That usage results in an output sort of of K over A to the alpha, an effect on output. Okay, and then there's A of those. Okay, so then if we do this, if we just sort of evaluate the integral we're going to get a times what's inside. So a times k over a to the alpha. All right, this is a, this is a k. All right, so we're just using the, all this, you know, the fact that the xi's are constant, we're using that now to evaluate these integrals, which become very easy when everything is constant. Okay. Um, <clears throat> right, and you know, like, you know, just geometrically, right? If you think, think about just like a simple, you know, you're integrating some function that's constant, right? From zero to A has some value F, right? You know, if you integrate that function, you know, from zero to A, F, well, that it's just the area, right? It's just A times F. Just integrating this this function here, which is constant, you get A times F, right? So that that's why we keep coming out with, these integrals just being a times whatever the value is, is that, you know, we're just kind of getting the area of a rectangle because, because the function itself is constant. Okay. Um, okay. So, so from this last line, okay, we can, we can actually do a little bit more, right? So you're going to get L to the one minus alpha. You know, if you combine those A's, you get A to the one minus alpha and then K, you know, it's just, just K to the alpha. Okay, so that's cool. But also, if you if you rearrange that, you're gonna you know you get k to the alpha, and then you get al to the one minus alpha, right? Okay, and if you recall, that's exactly the kind of production function that we used to assume with solo. Like literally, that's exactly what we would write before when we had solo with uh, capital and population and some technological uh, labor augmenting technology. Okay. So, so it turns out basically, it's this isn't quite an accident. I mean, it's sort of pre-planned, but you know, in the end, that A really does look like that technology that we used to have, that labor augmenting technology. Okay. But the difference is now instead of being exogenous, it's going to be endogenous. Okay. It's going to be endogenous in the sense that people are going to be choosing to do some research and generate a new product and hence increase A. Okay, so that's that's going to be the idea. So let me uh, one second here. Let me just pull up the notes to make sure I'm being I'm being consistent with uh with all of that. All right. Um, okay. So we can. So 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 that was sort of an aside on the the. What's what's happening at the highest levels? Okay, so what what really is the outcome, right? So so now we can see that you know <clears throat> you know having having more products, the higher the value for a, you're going to have more output, right? So you know even though you're splitting this capital over more and more goods, meaning you're using less and less for each individual good, because these goods are sort of differentiated, and people value that you are increasing total output. Okay. Um, okay, so, so now, <clears throat> so, so, okay, we, we, we basically, we found profit. Okay. It's, it's kind of complicated. Okay. But we're going to, we're going to be able to simplify it a bit as we go on. All right. Using some of this stuff here. Okay. So we found prop, uh, we're, we'll be able to simplify that a little bit. Okay. Um, and what we really want to do, okay, is think about the decision of, a potential inventor okay what's their decision going to look like okay um 
So, I guess I'm trying to think what the what the best way to approach this is. One second. Um, yeah. So I yeah we, we might not be able to finish everything today. So let me let me give you the overview. So basically, <clears throat> how do we think about this potential inventor? Let me just at this point I may as well just go down here. So how how do we think about a potential inventor? Okay. They're uh, they face they okay. So so they they have two options in life. Any worker basically in this world has two options in life. Okay, you can become a researcher. Okay, <clears throat> and if you become a researcher, um, maybe you invent a new product, which is good, like a new A. You're going to increase A, a new product. So sure, new product A. Okay, so you do some research, you, or you, you know, invention, and you create a new product. Okay. <clears throat> and then you become an, a monopolist. Okay. For some good I. Okay, and that's going to give you, you know, every year or whatever. Okay, some profit stream pi I which we kind of found before, um, which is going to have, you know, some net present value, say VI. Okay. So, so it'll be you know, essentially you, you, you get pi every year, right? But you, you know, if you've seen, you know, these bond formulas, right? So if you get pi every year, the net present value is going to be, it's going to be something like pi over R, be your, your, that, that yearly profit divided by the interest rate. Okay. So we'll work out exactly what that is, but it's, it's, you know, you convert, from a yearly thing into sort of the net present value, you just need that discount rate, which we're going to say is 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 the interest rate. Okay. Um, okay. So that's that's one option. Okay. So you know the return just just from the perspective of today at the researcher, it's basically sort of the probability that you're successful that you invent this new product. Okay. And let's say that let's say this is this is some probability like gamma. Okay, we're going to call it gamma. So with some probability gamma, you're successful, you invent a new product. Okay, and if you and when that happens, you you, know, you do the whole startup thing, you you start selling, you generate profits, and life is good. All right. Um, with probability one minus gamma, you're not successful. Okay, and you just get zero, which is it. That's kind of like, that's not great, but you know it's the way it, the way it works. Okay. Um, but with probability gamma, you are successful. Okay. Um, the other option, okay, so I guess here, the, the first thing is you're a worker, okay? You're, and you can either become a researcher or a producer. Okay, so a, pr a production worker, they're that L, right? So this is, this is like R, I guess, is what I'm calling R. Uh, and then the production worker is, is, is L, okay? So the, the production worker, I mean, they, they just go to work for one of these big firms like like Amazon or Walmart. Okay, so obviously people work for many different varieties of firms, not just those the the big box stores. Uh, but you know, just say a production worker, you, you go work for a firm. You, you you're not you're not generating new products, but you're you're just creating uh, existing products. Okay, um, and there the the outcome is not really risky. You know, you just get a wage. You get some wage W. Okay, so that's the choice, right? You either roll the dice as a researcher, give it your all, try and come up with a new product. Maybe you're successful, and, and if you are, you, you can expect that's a net present value VI, okay? Uh, or you become a production worker and you, you just get wage W, okay? Um, all right, so, so that's that's the nature of the choice. Okay, now what we wanna do is, is turn that sort of descriptive that, that description into a concrete sort of equation that, that'll, that'll help us solve this model. Okay. And, uh, okay. And so that, um, we can do that. All right. Um, and, and essentially, uh, the, the logic is going to be, is that the worker should actually be indifferent between these two things. Okay. Because these are both, both of these activities are necessary for a, a well-functioning society. Okay, I mean, you, you can do okay if, if you just only produce and don't do research, but you're not going to grow, 
right? Uh, conversely, if you only do research and don't produce, well, that, that would be a problem, okay? So both of these things, these activities are necessary for a well-functioning society, modern society. Um, and so pe people should be doing both of them, right? It shouldn't be all one or all the other, okay? And if, if everyone, you know, in, in this world also, a anyone can be either one, right? So anyone can be a researcher, anyone can be a producer, okay? Um, and given that anyone can choose either one of these options, if one of them gave a greater return, then everyone would just choose that, right? If, if, if being a producer gave a really high wage and being a researcher gave practically no return, then probably everyone would just be a producer. And that's okay, but but it, it, it wouldn't produce a, a good outcome, right? Uh, conversely, if being a researcher was just immensely profitable and, and low risk, and being a producer, the wages were just really, really low, uh, then everyone would be a researcher, which would also entail some problems, right? So so we, these two things should be roughly equal. And in fact, we're going to say they should be exactly equal, okay? Um, now, you know, in the real world, you know, as we see it, it looks like, you know, the, the returns to being a successful researcher are, are pretty, or like a successful inventor are pretty high, but then the probability may be kind of low. So then sort of the expected returns, especially if you incorporate risk aversion, uh, maybe are going to be on par with what you would get if you were a production worker. Okay. Of course, you also have people with different sort of propensities or, or desires to, to be a researcher or producer and that factors in, but we're kind of abstracting away from that. Okay. So, so what we're saying is that, you know, the return on these two activities should be equal, you know, um, R, you know, R equals L, whatever, the return on those, I guess. Um, and so then we just wanna translate that sort of notion into an equation, an equality, if you will, right? So uh, we can do that, all right? So, so what's the return on being a researcher? Well, it's actually, it's quite simple. It's just, you know, with some probability gamma, you're successful Okay, and if you're successful, you get that return vi. Well, we we can actually just call it v, some some expected return on on a new product. Okay, uh, and if you're a worker, well, you get wage w. Okay, so that's really it. It's just like you know, pro the probability of success as, at at invention times the return on conditional return on success v should be equal to the wage. Okay. Um, so that, that, that's sort of what we want to figure out, okay? Now, what do we have to work with? Well, we have pi. Remember, we found pi, okay? And we're going to be able to simplify that more, okay? And once we have pi, you know, we're going to be able to find that value, okay, by using the, I'll show you how to do it. We can use the interest rate. It's, it's pretty straightforward, okay? Um, and yeah, and then the wage, well, I remember in the beginning I mentioned that you know that 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 Amazon firm is hiring workers, okay, and that's gonna that's gonna give us some information about the wage through the their marginal product, okay. Well, we're we're gonna be able to use that information to 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 find out what the wage is, okay. So so that's that's the goal, okay. So you know at at this point and at this point we've already done a lot of like work for 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 eventually implementing this this equality here okay um right, because we we've, we've more or less figured out what is happening on the product markets right so we know you know what when you actually produce this new product you know how much do you sell it for how much do you sell what's your profit level okay and we'll be able to figure out the value pretty quickly okay so we, we kind of already know all that and then also from the product markets we, we have information about you know what's the wage you know because to, to, to know what the wage is, we need, we need to know what happens in the product markets. What are these workers doing? How much do they make when they do that and so on? Okay, so we, we're kind of, you know, we're very close to knowing that too. Okay, so um, yeah, and, and, that, and that, that'll that be enough. Okay, and and but, you, but if you think about, you know, uh, with, you know, just in, in terms of thinking about GDP generally, okay, but also a lot of the stuff we've done thus far, We've been thinking about like what's what's the share of income going to uh, to workers? What's the share of income going to, to capital owners? What, how and or slash um, profits for firms? Okay, which we can kind of group together. Uh, so we've talked we talk about that a lot. And that's really the question here is you know, there's some income going to wage, there's some income going to capital and profits. Okay, 
and and those are going to be important in also in in understanding this choice between being a researcher and a producer okay and it, it is going to basically what we're going to get out of this after you know not not in substantial amount of algebra is is we're going to get some share of researchers okay we're going to get some share of researchers okay uh <clears throat> Which is to say, what, what fraction of people are going to be researchers? Okay, because if everyone is a researcher and no one is a producer, okay, then this wage is going to shoot, the production wage is going to shoot way up. There's going to be a shortage of production workers. Okay, All right? Whereas if everyone is a producer and no one, no one is a uh, researcher, then the production wage is going to go down. Okay, so there's going to be some share, uh, share SR, which is going to equalize these, these two things. Okay, that that's the, the that's kind of the base of the logic. Okay, uh, we're gonna get some supply demand equilibrium and figure out what's the, what's that exact share. Okay, so that's the story there. Um, yeah, I mean, role model. It's it's believe it or not, it's actually on the simpler end of, of these types of models. Okay, uh, unfortunately, there's there's kind of no free lunch here, but um, it's also one of the it's it's the the classic it's the first the first one to sort of formalize these ideas okay so it does take a bit of time to go through okay the basic logic isn't that unusual i mean it, it corresponds i think to what we think about it sort of the product like cycle the cycle of invention how inventions occur and, and why they they are good for society uh it gets a bit complicated in the intermediate stages but at the end you actually get a relatively simple answer too so it'll, it'll be worth it okay um and uh, yeah, so I think next time we'll definitely be able to 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 really finally finish uh, finish it off. Okay, so that's it for now. Um, hope you guys have a good weekend, and I'll see you all on Tuesday. Right, thank you.